Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Emily Cavanaugh, a singer-songwriter who started an organization called A Song for You, where she brings together other songwriters to create individualized songs for patients who are in hospice or in the hospital. And it's a wonderful organization. We have a great conversation. I know you're going to love this one. So stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also leave a rating and review wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. That'll be really helpful for End of Life University. And if you're so inclined to offer a little bit of financial support, go to eoluniversity.com slash support. There you'll find three different ways that you can make contributions to help keep this channel and the End of Life University podcast on the air. And thanks in advance if you choose to do that. So now we'll move on with my interview with Emily Cavanaugh. Today, I'm so excited to welcome my very special guest, Emily Cavanaugh. Emily is an independent artist based in New York City. She's a singer, songwriter, and performer in places like New York, Chicago, and Dublin. Emily has made a career for herself as a singer, often working at the intersection of music and service, gigging, writing, and bringing music to marginalized communities. To date, she has performed or written for refugee communities, individuals facing homelessness and HIV, and seniors with memory loss. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Emily launched a music initiative called A Song for You, which we'll be talking all about in our conversation today. You can find Emily's music on all major streaming sites and her website, which is emilycavanaughmusic.com. And you can find the A Song For You music initiative at the website, hereisasongforyou.org. So Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I first, I think I read about your work. I think it was in People magazine because you were, you were featured in People. Is that right? Yeah, just recently just recently. Yeah. And um, that's what got me so interested in talking with you and learning all about you and what you do. And I, I wanted to start because I know that also you have training in social work and music and activism, and you've brought all of those together, which I think is really fascinating. So I was hoping you'd just give us a little bit more of your background and, and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. And my current background is making me giggle because I still haven't taken down my Christmas tree. <laughs> so, no, I, I haven't yeah. taken mine down either. It just doesn't show up. In the... <laughs> yeah, that's the long list of things that we could talk about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, I have 57 first cousins, which I always like to mention just because I think um, in a lot of ways it defines sort of where I am in my life today. You know, uh, community was a really big thing growing up and family was a really big thing. And when you're born with, you know, four siblings and you come into the world kind of with like, I guess, an inherited group of buddies that you always sort of have that sense of people have your back. And I guess I felt really lucky in that, in that way, maybe didn't know it at the time, you know, kind of growing up, it was like, <laughs> this was just how it was. And everything was a family party and we were all together. And but I think as I get a little bit older, I reflect on that and I realize it's it's probably one of the greatest gifts um, that I've that I've been given. So as I got older, I really started to think about, well, what's a way to bring in, you know, the sense of community, this love that I have for people and learning their stories and telling stories. And, you know, I come from a large Irish American um, crew. And so a lot of it is like, uh, you know, we connect with one another through storytelling. Right. And. I think it just became more evident to me that perhaps songwriting was the way. Um, but, you know, you move to New York City, uh, lots of people are talented, you're rarely the most talented person in any room. So I think I always sort of thought, well, I could be a songwriter, but I also want to find a way to, to give back. Um, I knew I couldn't teach. I don't have the, the patience that teachers have. My mom and my sister are teachers, so I come from a long line of teachers. I didn't have the discipline to write a lesson plan or um, get in front of a classroom of kids. But I knew that I loved to learn about other people and what makes them tick. 
Um, and so I guess I sort of always thought that singing and social work were not all that different. They were, um, one was about hearing people's stories and one was about telling my own. And so that's how I combined the two. So I did, I, I attended um, Webster University in St. Louis where I studied with an amazing jazz teacher, Debbie Lennon, shout out to Debbie Lennon, um, who said, you know, when you sing, just make sure that you sing what really comes from your heart. And I found that that was jazz and that was storytelling and that was sort of finding ways to tell my own stories. Um, and so as a musician, that's what I did. But then I moved to New York and I went to school for social work with an emphasis in music therapy uh, and music. So I sort of combined the two for a long time and I was lucky enough to be doing that up until the pandemic. So for about 10 years working at the, the intersection of music and service. Mm, I love that kind of bringing head and heart together and finding a way to use your creativity in your work every day. That that's really beautiful and amazing. Thank you. Well, I feel really lucky too, to be honest. I don't know. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit of a luxury to get to do what you love. I, I've obviously, I've never really made lots of money, I've never really uh, achieved things in those ways that we traditionally, I think, uh, value success. But I've always been able to have a small amount of success in that I, I get to do, you know, what I love every day. Mm. Well, one thing that I didn't read that was part of your bio was that you wrote a song about the Rwandan genocide that you've performed at the United Nations. And um, that really uh, gave me goosebumps. I listened to the song. I saw the video that was made about it. Um, really beautiful. And so you've been able to do some big, powerful things with your music. Thank you, Karen. I mean, honestly, that was all the inspiration of a woman who's now become a dear friend of mine. But at the time I was a social worker and I was doing social work for a good four or five years full time and just singing on the side and singing gigs as much as I could. Um, and it was never really like I was waiting for anything else to happen. I just was so lucky that I was in a moment where I was able to do a bit of both. Um, but my whole job in that moment was to help this person write her story and just coincidentally, at the same time, I was putting out a record and I was so inspired by her story that I actually ended up including her, the song that I wrote for her on, on this record that I released. Um, and so that community has continued to be an inspiration to me. I just have met the most lovely and generous and amazing people uh, through, through the Rwandan connection. Mm. Wow, that, that's, that's really inspiring. And yeah. uh, it sounds like you get inspiration by all kinds of things and the, and the people that you meet. And that's what kind of moves you to, to write music for them. That's funny you say that because I was actually listening to an old, pod, an old podcast um, the other day and it was Jeff Tweedy being interviewed. And he said, the only real job of a musician is to stay inspired. And I remember thinking like, that is such a brilliant, like profound way to say it. But I do feel like in a way that is my job is to, to always be curious and to always be interested and to, and to find inspiration in little places. And um, I suppose I'm lucky because I kind of just, I guess I always sort of was curious, you know, even as a kid, like just everything, probably to the detriment of my poor mother, like it was just everything was like, <laughs> tell me about this and why that? And everything was why, 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 you know? Um, but I've been able to, you know, as I've gotten older, maybe uh, funnel that into something that has made a little bit of a career. <laughs> yeah. And um, we mentioned a song for you um, in the, in the bio that you started at the, the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would love to hear the story behind that and how you got inspired to do that. And, and then, and then also to tell the audience what it consists of. Sure. So a song for you, um, being very honest was sort of an accident. I, in the midst of the pandemic, I was lucky enough to, to go back to Chicago for what was meant to just be about two and a half weeks and it turned into two and a half months. And for such a crazy time, as we all look back and reflect in different ways, I think there were a few little silver linings that came. And I think for me, the biggest silver lining was time with my family, right? So I, my dad turned 70, my mom and I got to walk, my little, you know, my brothers had babies. It, it was just sort of an amazing, um, though dark time for the world, an amazing time to be with, with, 
loved ones. And I remember sitting, watching the news with my mom and, and recounting these stories and learning about all of these people that were passing and particularly people that were passing in rooms where people couldn't be in the room to hold their hand, you know? And like everyone, I mean, it was no different. I think we were all so moved by that in, in different ways. Um, but I found myself feeling a bit helpless. You know, I didn't know what I could do. I, I, you know, I'm sitting in a city that I grew up in that I, I love and I identify as home. Um, but so many of my friends are in this home, which is New York. Uh, so it was the, it was sort of the center of the pandemic for a while. And I just remember watching it and thinking like, there's got to be something that we can do. And I kept coming up short with the answer other than like binging my feelings and watching Netflix and all the things that we did anyway, you know, but I realized what I could do was I could, I could write a song. Um, so essentially what started as just kind of an idea, like maybe I could send a song or two, you know, I recorded a version of the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to a nurse uh, in a hospital in Chicago and just said, I would just love for you to share this with anyone that needs to hear it. And I didn't even know if anyone needed to hear it. I mean, who knows, you know, it was sort of a shot in the dark. Um, but what began is just that then grew to, I'd love to learn more about your patients. Like what kinds of songs do they like? Like, what are they dealing with right now beyond even COVID? You know, primarily it was COVID that we were writing for, but it was really like, what can we do? And the answer was we can send a song. And so a song for you grew out of this idea of sending songs to people in a time of crisis that needed a bit of hope and comfort. And it's now grown into something that um, has extended beyond the pandemic and is really about writing songs recorded personalized songs based on the lives of the patients and the people we're writing for, primarily for them to hear as like a, a little bit of a tribute to their legacy, but also for their families to keep long after, after they've gone. Um, so, you know, I say it was an accident because um, for a little girl from the South side of Chicago, like, I don't know, I guess I just already found that I was so lucky just to be living my dream in New York. I would have been happy with that. Um, and I would have continued just doing just that. And it's not like I've, you know, steered off the path, but I think this thing really moved me enough. Um, and then it received such a beautiful response from the community that it's now moved into a place where it's become its own nonprofit here in New York City. Wow. And I, I so resonate with that feeling that I think all of us had early on during the pandemic of helplessness, of there's so much need, there's so much pain and suffering. And what can I do? How can I, what can I do from my little house, <laughs> you know, sitting here, what could I offer that could make a difference? And you know, I look to someone like you and like, you know, you, a, a doctor, like a physician, a nurse, like there, there were people who were doing so much and could do so much. And I think so many of us in the, like in the arts communities and the, you know, it was sort of like, well, in what ways could we be useful? And to be honest, I didn't know what the answer to that was for so long. And I still don't know what the answer to that is. But in this tiny little way, I think uh, I found, you know, a, a possible, a possible answer. Well, I, I am a big believer in the power of music for one thing, like this healing power of music, but also soothing, like soothing for anxiety and yeah. depression. But I, I really believe that music helps with trauma. It ha can help us feel connected and safe. And when you're writing songs specifically for a, a person, I, I can only imagine they feel seen and heard like someone knows me, someone gets me and wrote a song about it. And knowing that that song will persist after they die and their family will be able to keep it. That is just, that's an incredible legacy to leave for, and to help people create. Well, we, I have to give a shout out to all of the people that have made that possible, you know, like the nurses and the doctors and the chaplains and the, initially we were even writing for them as just a way to boost morale. You know, we were writing for, wrote for a staff of 300 in Chicago or no, I'm sorry, in New York. Um, I can't remember anymore which city I'm in. <laughs> and it was just as a way to say thank you at Christmas, you know, um, and then the following year, a lovely woman in Idaho reached out and said, look, I have all this footage. I have all of this you know, all of these stories of all of these people that I've collected through this time, but I'm, I'm tired. My staff is burnt out. Like we need to do something to, to 
you know, increase the morale and to really say thank you to these frontline workers. And so we ended up writing for a healthcare system of like, I think close to 10,000 people uh, called St. Wow. Luke's in Idaho. And, you know, so it can be in the smallest way and then to something relatively large like that. Um, but you're right, it does, it, it, it speaks to, I think like I'm biased as a musician, but I think that music goes to these places that words can't, you know? So I always found that as a social worker, as much as I loved, my training and as much as I loved that work and as much as I still identify as a social worker in my heart, I think that I found like it was such a different kind of impact that that we could make when people were able to just sort of sit in a group and like listen to lyrics and talk about how that related to their life. Or for instance, I, I get to sing um, for a group of seniors with Alzheimer's, you know, and so few of our participants like know their name some days, but they know the song that they danced to on their wedding you know, or um, there's this brilliant woman named Angelica who once ran the Angelica Theater, which is like a, it's a staple in New York culture. And, um, you know, when she would come and she would sing and dance and she would move, she's amazing. But um, she, it took music to really bring her to a place of, of being present and everything could come through. Uh, so it's almost as if like, everything else goes away, you know, um, I think when there's a song that someone can connect to. Mm. I find. Recently, I think I saw on social media, a video of a woman in her nineties or so, who was a ballerina now has mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, but they played for her the music that she used to dance to. And she was doing all of the hand motions, like recreating the dance. And it was incredible and amazing. Like the power of music to touch deep inside for someone who's, who's lost all of their, all of their short-term memory, but to still make them feel who they are to make, to make them know who they are in that moment. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I get a little emotional thinking about it, but I think what you're speaking to as well was such an impetus like that drove me in the pandemic of like this idea that again, that people were dying alone, but also that people were dying. And it was almost like we got to a point where we became, I don't want to say immune to this, to this loss, but we became so used to it in a way that I felt like here's a way to highlight someone's actual life. Like, again, in a very, very tiny way, right? But here's a way to say back to them, like, I see you and I love knowing a little bit about you just through the story that your social worker shared or your daughter shared with the chaplain and they shared, you know, like, I want to reflect that back um, in some way. And because one of the biggest needs people have at the very end of life is to know that their life had meaning, to know that that they did something or, or there was a, some reason for them to be here or, or something came from their existence. And so to create a song that kind of testifies to that is it's very powerful. And I know you said to me before, Oh, it feels like such a small thing, but I think it's a, a really big thing in terms of each individual and in terms of being able to just find peace at the end of life and to feel like um, it, I, I did do something when I was here and I do matter and someone bothered to write this song that tells my story. I, I think that's amazing. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I would have to say there's, I almost feel like I've been co-writing some of these songs in a way, one, because I have <laughs> with the artist, but two, because for instance, like when you were speaking, I was thinking of this woman who reached out um, and I shouldn't even say what, I mean, she was a girl, she was, you know, 16 years old, but she reached out with this really personal story about her father. And she shared this whole thing about how they really, you know, um, her mom and dad split when they were young and or when she was young and she didn't really know him, but through music, she connected to him. And through the last years of his life, it was, it was that and their sense of uh, community and faith that really kept them together. And she was so much more poignant than I could ever be. I mean, the way that she wrote telling me about him and the things she loved about him. And she, she shared that all she really wanted captured was the sentiment of like, I'll continue to, to, to talk about you and to sing about you and to like, you know, after you're gone. And so the song like sort of wrote itself, like it was one of the easiest songs I've ever written because essentially like she wrote it for me just in her love for her father. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so now that's actually one of the few songs I'm thinking of recording and, and, you know, sharing because the family has, has even asked what, you know, would we, um, cause it's called singing your name. And it's this idea of like, I'll go on singing your name, like even after you've gone. Um, wow. but I never would have had the depth to come up with that on my own. Had it not been for this girl, you know, that's what I was going to ask you about your songwriting process and how, how you do it if you just could, can describe it, I don't know. I don't know. If you sure. can. <laughs> I can tell you it's changed so much in the last two years because what used to be like, you know, I would just like write fun little love songs or, or even like, you know, sad heartbreak songs, whatever you write when you're a female singer songwriter. Um, I, I no longer feel as called to write those. Like I really, um, I will write those again. You know, I, I have to pay my rent, <laughs> but, um, but I much more, I'm interested in like sharing other people's stories, which in a weird way, it's like, it's personal or it's, it's so interesting to me how it can be both so personal and so collective at the same time. Cause I find that there's so many themes of universality and like the connection we all have. And even in really dark times, like still finding the meaning and the joy. And I think that in a funny way, the process almost mirrored the world and then the song almost mirrored the process and the world if that makes sense whereas in the past I think it was just like I don't know I went through a breakup and I wrote a song. <laughs> you know like I think I think it's maybe maybe evolved a little um as the result of life so it sounds like you get information from the person requesting the song they they write and tell you a story and that starts as kind of the basis for the song that you'll write yeah, no, that's a great question. Essentially, like, I finally kind of understand the process enough to like put it in a, a succinct way. But essentially, for a while there, I was just cold calling hospitals and hospices. And then we started to develop like real partnerships with places. So there's three that are our primary. There's um, VNS Health here in New York City. Um, there is Mission Hospice in California. And then there's Hospice of the Valley in Arizona. So we still write for many other places, but those are like our primary spots. And what happens is I'll talk to a social worker. The social worker will share the name of a patient. Uh, there's a small intake process, but essentially it's just telling us the name of the patient, the background, um, the person that they're requesting the song on behalf of. So sometimes it's a daughter, sometimes it's a partner, sometimes it's just the, the hospital staff. Um, and you know, here's the sentiment we want conveyed. Here's the type of songs they like. Here's the type of songs they don't like. Cause I think that's just as important, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's like having your last meal. You don't need it to be something you don't, you know, you don't want a cheeseburger if you don't want a cheeseburger. So then from there that can influence or inform what it is that we'll write. And ideally like in a true ideal world, I could then take that uh, assignment essentially and send it to a songwriter and say, here's this person. I think it's perfect for your style. What do you think? Um, because it's been such an amazing response that we've had, we're in a moment now of sort of transition between doing this initiative, you know, um, just because we love it and it's a labor of love to doing it as like an actual nonprofit. So we're now in a moment where we're actually looking for more songwriters, right? Because almost the requests are um, greater than the staffing needs that we, or the staffing that we currently have. So our need right now is to be able to match more song requests with more songwriters. And so then the process from there would be, then that songwriter takes the song, the request, learns a little bit more about the family. And then they generally have between like a week and 10 days to get um, the song back, of course, depending on the, the situation and the need at the hospice. Yeah, it's true because it's usually, it's usually a time limited thing. I mean, you get the request at the very end of someone's life. So there, there isn't a lot of time to work on it. Yeah. And for a long time, I was working with songwriters in Nashville. And so they're used to writing to a deadline, but there's so many people who are, you know, um, myself included, didn't have as much before where they had to write to a certain date, you know? And so that's been a really interesting challenge as a writer. Um, but one that everyone has been up for. I mean, I can't say enough nice things about the people who have, it gets me like, but you know, one, the community that you work in, like the, the hospice world is just, it is a level of heart work that like, I, I truly think like you guys are angels. Like, I don't know any other way to say it. Um, 
if I could be half as nice as you, I swear. I, but then also just like the response of the musicians who, you know, people who are working, um, who are local, who are, do other jobs, but are still taking time out of their day to people who are touring, to people who make a living, you know, to people who are small, like I am, like don't have a huge presence, but like, that's how they pay their rent, you know? Um, and then to like Grammy nominated, Grammy award-winning songwriters who, who every single person has said, yes, like, yes, we will write a song. Yes. We'll find a way to be part of this. Yes. We will share this mission. And like that kind of generosity, like I think especially when the world was so dark for so long has been so inspiring um, to me. And I know that's a much longer answer to that question <laughs> than was probably. But, needed, but... I was going to say, it sounds like it has touched the hearts of the songwriters. I mean, who maybe themselves needed an outlet like this or needed a way to give something that had deeper meaning and oh, yeah. a song for you has created it. I think um well, and I can't even take credit for that. I just think the need was there in the world. And so many people like jumped at the opportunity to be able to, to give what they could in that time. And, you know, it's a really, again, it's a nice problem to have that now everyone's back to work and touring and writing songs. So we're trying to uh, build an even larger community outside of our already community. So it's a, it's a good place to be. It's just that sort of where, that sort of where we're at, where we're at right now in the, in the process. So this is a message I want to make sure the audience is picking up on <laughs> that you're looking for singer songwriters who, and I mean, is there any kind of commitment that they write a certain number of songs or it's just anyone who would say, Hey, sure. Here's my styles. Send me someone and I'll write a song for them to, you know, 100%. send me a story. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's really just the eagerness to do it. Um, you know, the ability, I think, to have a sort of sensitivity to telling someone's story, it is different than telling your own, but most of these people are way beyond that like they know what they're doing you know so they can they can kind of parse that out um but we'd like to get to a place honestly where we can start paying musicians we're not quite there yet but that would be our goal uh probably not necessarily for this year but for sure by this time next year so that's also an incentive is like you know at some point it could become a stipended thing for now it's really just people that want to give a song or or two um because, you know, when we started, it was really just let's send songs. It wasn't necessarily let's write songs. Like it's kind of grown over time, right? It was never, I don't think I really had a strong vision. I guess it's one of the only upsides of not being a planner. <laughs> like I was just sort of like, <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> You're going with the flow. <laughs> yeah. And I'm now an accidental CEO. Like I don't even know how to <laughs> check books. Um, but, you know, I think in a funny way, it's, it's been beautiful to like allow that to grow organically too. Whereas if I was more of what I'm sure my mother would have wished <laughs> and could have foreseen any of this, I don't know if, I don't know if I could have taken it on actually. Um, so it's been a really a beautiful adventure. Yeah. Well, even what you're doing now might've seemed way too big back at the very beginning when you, <laughs> when you, <laughs> when you sent that very first song. Yeah. When I was cold calling places and they're like, we don't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it didn't occur to me that of course you need a wide variety of songwriters because when people state their preference in types of music, you, you, you may be a very gifted songwriter, but you can't necessarily write music for every single genre that's out there. So it makes sense. You, you need really diverse songwriters. So yeah. Ev and we're everyone. Trying, yeah. We're trying to reach people in every community as well. So, you know, we've had requests for songs in Spanish. My Spanish is not amazing. We've had requests for songs in French. We're able to bring in French, you know, singer songwriters. Uh, we've found ways to, to match the need. Um, we just know that as we're growing, like to be able to really match it and match it in a way with like real integrity, we have to expand. So yeah, that totally makes sense. And that the need is enormous. So there will, there will always be an, a need for the songs and it's just bringing together the people who can help create those songs. And I'm sure on, on that end of it too, there are so many creators out there who would absolutely love to be part of this and love to contribute a few songs and to be helpful. Yeah. And we would love that. And, you know, I'm always careful to say like, we don't have the market cornered here on writing personalized songs. People have been doing this for ages, you know? Um, 
I think it's just that it's it's a little bit of a specific niche as I don't need to tell a hospice physician to be writing for people like at the end of life primarily. So I think that's the thing that we're really trying to um, to get across is that while we loved writing for first responders and frontline workers and would do that forever, frankly, if someone asked me to, um, but we just found that this was where the real need was. So, um, so many of our songwriters that have come to us, there's just like an inherent sensitivity in what they're writing, given the subject matter, you know? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Maybe some of them who themselves have experienced uh, an end of life situation with someone they love or, um, and, and, and yeah. for whatever reason they've been touched and, and they want to contribute something. And and I know you mentioned you're becoming a 501c3 nonprofit. Is that right? And um, which entails a huge amount of work as well. And so another need you have would be for people to just serve on a board and to be advisors, um, people who can help get that off the ground. And that's a, that's a huge project. And it may not feel like it's entirely in, in your wheelhouse to do all the work to get right. that, that part of that part of it up and running too. I, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful that my parents were both very hardworking. <laughs> so I saw, you know, what it was like to, to balance lots of jobs and responsibilities and things. Um, but yeah, to your point, a hundred percent, like, I, I don't know that I have the, the capacity as much to be doing the administrative side you know, plus uh, managing all of the social sides of things and, and still writing the songs and, and then still, you know, my own career, like gigging. And I still sing um, regularly for the council house where we sing for the seniors with Alzheimer's. And so it's, it's, um, it's a lovely uh, juggling act and I, and I'm learning as I go and I'm really enjoying it, but yeah, anyone interested with any experience <laughs> uh, on that side of things is, is welcome to reach out. So I know you're in New York City. Are you looking for board members who would be local, who would live there? Or can you have a, a board composed of people remote, remotely who could meet um, totally with, with remote? You know, that's actually been one of the, again, like the few silver linings, right, of this time. Like someone said to me the other day, will you ever go to in person with this? Like, will you ever be performing in the hospitals and the hospices? And one, I think I'm really sensitive to the music therapy community as someone who's not a licensed music therapist, you know, who just works as a musician um, with a background in social work, but not as a therapist. Uh, I never want to like step on any toes or like cross any lines like that. That world is already so full and thriving. And those people are already doing such great work. So coming into the hospital wouldn't really be our thing. But also, I think, interestingly enough, we found that people really like having a recorded song because it's something that they can keep forever. So in a way, there's not even really a need to come in, you know? And so I would say the same goes for like our board members. Like we don't really need as much in-person interaction anymore. Like we're able to do everything remote. So yeah, just anyone with experience and the eagerness to do this and um, be so grateful. I'm putting it out there in hopes that someone listening Thank you says, for the plug. oh my gosh, I'd love to be part of that project. <laughs> that sounds incredible. So um, so hopefully we can attract a few board members and a few songwriters. And that would be amazing. <laughs> and we have good parties. We had a good Christmas party. You can see from the, <laughs> I see the beautiful tree. <laughs> well, well, I have no doubt that you're going to do this. I mean, uh, no doubt that you'll put it together, but it'd be great if we could find a little bit of support or assistance for you along the way. And also people willing to make donations. Um, since I know you don't charge for the songs, for, there's not never a charge for the patients who receive a song. No, no. And, we, and our mission is to be able to keep that free for as long as possible. You know, we are starting to partner with hospices and hospitals. So if there's a budget, of course, but um, that's never a prerequisite. Yeah. yeah so um, it's like, like what good work, what powerful work. And um, I like that idea, perhaps like a hospice's foundation could help sponsor you to write songs. I mean, your organization for to write songs, like I could see how that that might work out. Well, that would be incredible. Absolutely. You know, and, and we're because we're such babies in this, like we're still so new. It's still such early days which is funny, right? Because we've been doing it since like June of 2020, but really not incorporated other than till the last six months. So um, we're open to ideas. 
yeah, open to growing. Well, well, my hope is someone's listening out there who will be just the right person to could maybe step up and, and offer some, some of the support and the help that you need in, in any way. possible. Yeah. Well, and I, I know what a great community you have just having listened to your podcast. And I think I was sharing with you the Tracy Wheeler listening to the end well project. Like that was incredible. And just realizing the work that people are doing, like truly the hard, real work every day. Um, I'm so inspired all the time by it and just being part of it in such a small way, you know, um, for, for my birthday this year, I was able to go visit one of my very best friends uh, in California. And it worked out that one of the hospices that I write for is actually based out there. So we actually did a, a small little performance, like just a backyard performance. And it happened to be when it was like 185 degrees or whatever in California. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was an interesting day. But the I bring that up because it's the first time I've ever done anything um, uh, bedside, like live. So getting to sing to patients, it was the most profound feeling like to stand there with someone in possibly the last, you know, few days of their life. Um, and it just gave me, I, I already had such an appreciation, but it just gave me such a deep appreciation for the work that you guys are doing all the time. And as someone who's, you know, has dealt with her fair share of, I, I lost a very dear friend, um, when we were only 19 and uh, you know, that shaped a lot of the, the work that I want to do in the world. And she was such an influence because she was just so funny and had the most amazing sense of humor and could look at life, like even in the tough times with such a, an ability to see the funny, you know? And so she's just always been someone that I carry every day in my heart, but now I get to carry in this work. Um, and you know, the loss of grandparents, uh, the loss of a, a very special, person that I dated for a long time, you know, just things like that, that already sort of shaped what I, what I was wanting to do, but I don't think I ever would have had the courage to maybe do on my own, or frankly, the time. Um, and then life just had other plans. And, uh, you know, I think just all in the midst of a pandemic, not knowing what to do, um, this little baby was born. So I feel really grateful. And I feel particularly grateful to the people that do this every day. Well, I love that you followed your guidance to end yeah. up doing what you're doing right now without having any idea if it, yeah. <laughs> how it would work or if anyone would receive it oh or not. And, and yeah. I, I love the way this project was born, but I wanted to say that one of the things that I've learned through the work I've done and also through doing a podcast like this is that it really does take a village to help people at the end of life. And it really is. I mean, hospice care is team oriented. So we have a whole team of people who come together and you are now a member of that team in for a number of different hospices. And each person on the team does what you're doing. We bring our creativity. We offer whatever gifts we have, you know, to put it in the pot and <laughs> hope between all of us, we, we will be able to give people what they need and we'll make a difference. And so I, so I did want to thank you because you are a valuable member of that team and what you're creating makes a difference. And then also that the community, this community is vast. It's like a huge network that spreads out everywhere. And part of the beauty of doing podcasts is being able to reach people in different places yeah. and um, connect people together. And so I'm hoping that will happen for you, that you will make some new connections after doing this podcast with, um, with other people who see your vision and would like to share in it. I would love that. I would love that. I mean, it's just been a gift to meet you and talk to you. So even if it doesn't go much beyond this, that's okay. But thank you. And thanks for spreading the word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so excited and I, uh, Hmm. I'd love to, well, I did listen to your music. I listened to you sing on the video that you did for the um, Rwandan genocide, but is there any other play? Where can I listen to you sing <laughs> some of your songs? <laughs> most, of our, um, most of my work is live, you know, so it's a lot of gigging and playing, you know, here, and like you said earlier, like in New York and Chicago and a little bit in Ireland, um, but you can find me on Spotify. So it's just Emily Kavanaugh or on um Instagram or any of the fun socials, you know, so it's Emily Cavanaugh music, but I should give more of a shout out to our, to our project, which is, you know, it is called a song for you. Um, but we call, but we 
have used the handle here as a song for you because I think a song for you was taken. <laughs> Fair enough. So that's a place that people can find us too. And and um, in all fairness, I have not done the best job at promoting much on social media in terms of our Instagram page. But that's another thing. If you ever know of any like kind of young hip millennials, because I'm the oldest millennial I know, uh, who wants to run a social media page, we're we're looking for that too. Um, Cause you can be updated there about like some of our adventures and where we're writing for and who we're writing for. Um, but as far as the music goes, it's just Spotify or Apple music or any of the, the main streaming sites. And I should mention that Kavanaugh is spelled without a U, correct? <laughs> um, yeah. Just because I always tend to add the, the U in there, but it doesn't have a U. C-A-V-A-N-A-G-H. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. I've almost thought about just like, I, I don't even correct people anymore because I'm like, maybe I should just change it to the one with the U. But we're like old, old Irish spelling apparently. So it's uh, just C-A-V-A-N-A-G-H, no U. So Emily Kavanaugh, music.com and here is a song for you.org. So Got those are it. the two websites to go to, but um, gosh, it's just been so much fun, Emily, to you talk know, to you. I keep talking to you. <laughs> I keep talking to you. And I'm so excited to connect with your daughter and other songwriters that you know. Um, and I should mention too, particularly people with that emphasis or, or that love for the healing arts, you know, I know that you were sharing that something she wants to do. So I would love to hear from, from more people like that. Yes, absolutely. Well, I hope that you'll get some, some context. Oh, and how do people get in touch with you? Could, do they go to oh. the website? Here is, oh. here is a song for you. Or you can just write, you can uh, email me directly at Emily Cavanaugh music at Gmail. That's fine as well. Um, we have had a little bit of a, our website's all good, but when the people story came out, we had a few people reach out to us that we weren't able to capture their email address. So I just make sure to say now, please do, even if you think we have it, please include the best way to contact you. Cause that's been one of the hardest parts for us is like, there's so many people that have asked for songs that I would love to write for. We just haven't been able to get in touch with them. So that's important. All right. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So listeners, <laughs> now, you know, step up if you're a singer songwriter or, you know, someone, lots of us know people who are singer songwriters who might be interested, or if you want to help out on a board or with social media, um, I just, I'd love for us all to gather together and help support what you're doing. Cause I think it's, I think it's very valuable and makes a huge difference. Thank you so much, Karen. I just love talking to you. Thank you. Yeah. Same here. And thank you for listening to your guidance and, um, and stepping up and doing a very good thing in the world. Thank you. Well, I get just as much out of it. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's good to hear. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Emily Cavanaugh about a song for you. I found her to be such a wonderfully warm and humble and generous person. And I'm so grateful she took time to talk with me and also just to spread the word about a song for you. And hopefully some people listening will feel like stepping up to help Emily out with a board or to become a singer songwriter yourself for a song for you. So until we're together the next time, remember that we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever comes next and love each and every moment of your precious life. Bye-bye.